Hello, I'm Louis Serrano and this is Serrano Academy and this video is about the discrete Fourier transform. The discrete Fourier transform is a very important mathematical transformation which goes from sequences to sequences. It's a cousin of the continuous Fourier transform which is very important in waves but this one has its own really special properties. For example, it is able to tell if a sequence is periodic or not and what its period is. Now this is very important in things like Shor's algorithm, which breaks cryptographical systems by factoring really large numbers in a very fast way. And this is done using the discrete Fourier transform. Actually it's done using a quantum computer, but we'll see that in some future videos. Now the discrete Fourier transform has a bit of an ugly formula, but I wanna show you that this is not so bad. I like to see it geometrically as a bunch of rods that are connected and are rotating in the plane. So let's get to the discrete Fourier transform. This is the formula for the discrete Fourier transform. It looks complicated, but it's actually not so bad. I like to see it in a geometric way. So to see it in a geometric way, let's look at what the complex plane is. The complex plane consists of the real numbers that are on the horizontal line and the imaginary numbers that are on the vertical line. So the real numbers are the numbers that we're used to. So negatives and positives and decimals and rationals and irrationals like square root two, like pi, like e, like four, like minus seven, anything like that. And the imaginary ones are very much like the real ones, except they always have an i attached to it. So there's one i, two i, pi i, minus 17 i, etc. And i is a very special number. It's the square root of minus one. There's actually two square roots of minus one, which are i and minus i, but we're gonna take i by convention. And then every number in this plane can be obtained as a sum of a real number and an imaginary number. For example, the point three comma two, we're gonna write it as three plus two i, and the point minus two minus one, we're gonna write it as minus two minus i. So just imagine as any number in the Cartesian plane that can be written in the form pq is now gonna be p plus qi. And that's all the math we need because now I can show you the discrete Fourier transform of a sequence. For example, let's take the sequence four, three, two, one. So in order to find the discrete Fourier transform or the DFT of the sequence four, three, two, one, we are going to drop bars of lengths four, three, two, and one. And now I'm gonna create a new sequence. So the first element of the new sequence is the point where the last bar ends, which is this point over here. That's the first point of the DFT. Now we're gonna do the exact same thing, except we're gonna rotate every bar 90 degrees. We're not rotating the first bar, but we're rotating all the other ones. So let's rotate them all 90 degrees. And now rotate the last two 90 degrees. And now rotate the last one 90 degrees. And wherever the end of these bars is, we're gonna put an X there. That is our second element of the Fourier transform. Now for the first one, we're gonna take 180 degrees. So let's rotate starting from the yellow one, 180. Now starting from the green one, and now starting from the blue one. And let's record this point over here. And for the final one, we're gonna do 270 degrees. So we rotate everything 270 degrees, then the last two, then the last one, and wherever this hits, we are going to put an X. So the DFT is going to be these four points in the order that we got them. So that's 10. This one is the point two minus two, which as we learned is gonna be written as two minus two I. This one's gonna be the point two, and this one's gonna be the point two plus two I. So in that order, those numbers are going to be the DFT or the discrete Fourier transform of this sequence. So it's not so bad, right? Let's do one more example quickly. Let's do the DFT of one, two, three, four, five, six. Now in the previous example, we rotated by 90 because we had four points and 360 divided by four is 90. Now we're gonna rotate 60 degrees, but we're gonna start by rotating zero degrees first. So we're gonna put them together and the point at the very end is gonna be 21. That's the first element of our DFT. Notice that the first element of the DFT is always the sum of all the numbers in the sequence. Now we're gonna rotate 60 degrees because we have six points. So 360 divided by six is 60. And we get the following drawing because every segment it's rotated 60 degrees from the previous one. So this ends up at the point minus three plus three square root three i. Now we're going to do 120 degrees. So this is what happens when we rotate 120 degrees. We end up at the point minus three plus square root three i. And now let's do 180 degrees. So each one gets rotated 180 degrees with respect to the previous one. 
and we end up at the point minus three. That's a real number because we never left the real line. And finally, let's do 240 degrees. We get something similar to what we got before except inverted. So we end up with the point minus three minus square root three i. And the last one is going to be 300 degrees, which is very much the same as when we rotated 60 except upside down. And we end up with the point negative three minus three square root three i. So that is the last point of our sequence. So the DFT of one, two, three, four, five, six is this sequence on the right. 21, negative three plus three root three i, etc., all the way to negative three minus three square root three of i. So now this looks like a complicated process, but when I want to calculate it, I actually use Wolfram Alpha. Wolfram Alpha is really good for calculating this. And another thing that I use is the FFT function in SciPy in Python. It gives me the exact same solution as I got from rotating these bars. We may notice that Wolfram and SciPy give different answers and that's because one is scaled differently. So the one that we're gonna see in this video is the one that we get from the SciPy FFT. Now here is a question. If the DFT of the sequence four, three, two, one is the sequence 10, two minus two i, two and two plus two i, is there a way to invert this? That if I start from the sequence in the right, I get the sequence on the left? And the answer is yes, and it's actually pretty simple. So let's take a look at the bars again. So in order to obtain the DFT, we always rotated clockwise a certain angle. Well, what's the inverse of rotating clockwise? It's rotating counterclockwise. So the question is, could the inverse be just rotating counterclockwise? And the answer is almost. So let's say that here we have the sequence four, three, two, one, which can be represented by these bars over here. And how do we represent the sequence 10, two minus two i, two and two plus two i as bars? Well, in the same way, the first bar is of length 10, the second bar is two minus two i, but what's two minus two i? Well, it's this bar over here. So the bars don't need to be horizontal. They can be in any direction. The next one is two, which goes in this direction. And the next one is two plus two i, which goes in this direction. So now the question is, if I rotate these bars backwards, do I get the original four, three, two, one? And the answer is I do almost, I get something pretty close and it's easy to fix. So let's see what happens. When I take my sequence 10, two minus two i, two and two plus two i, and I start rotating not clockwise, but counterclockwise. Well, for the first term, I have to rotate by zero. So I end up with 16, which is the sum of the four numbers. As you can see, the sum of the four numbers in the right is 16 because the two i and the minus two i cancel each other. So I have a 16. Now let's rotate 90 degrees counterclockwise. So when I rotate the last three segments, I get this. Then I rotate the last two segments and I get this. And then I rotate the last segment and I get this. So what do we get? We get 12. Now what happens when we rotate 180 degrees counterclockwise? Well, here's the first rotation, the second one, and the third. And we get eight. Now what do you think we're gonna get for the last one? I will take some guesses. When we rotate 270 degrees counterclockwise, then here's the first rotation. Here is the second one. And here is the third one. And we got a four. So instead of getting four, three, two, one, we got 16, 12, eight, and four. How do we fix that? How do we turn that into four, three, two, one? Well, we divide by four. And four is the number of elements in the sequence. So the inverse DFT is rotate backwards and divide by the number of elements in the sequence. In other words, it's here. If you wanna go backwards from the answer to the input, then you rotate the segments backwards and you divide by N. That is the inverse DFT. So to remember, if you are gonna do the DFT, you rotate clockwise. If you're gonna do the inverse DFT, you rotate counterclockwise and then divide by the number of elements in the sequence. So now let's get to why these bar rotations actually define that formula that we saw at the beginning. So a very important thing about the complex plane is the unit circle. So all the points at a distance of one from the origin. So obviously the points one minus one I and minus I will be there. But a generic point here will be at an angle of theta with the horizontal and it's actually called e to the i theta. This is a beautiful formula of Euler and that summarizes cosine of theta plus i sine of theta. We will not get to that in this video, but the cosine of theta and i sine of theta come from trigonometry and they become e to the i theta after we use a Taylor series expansion for cos and for sine and for e. And now we have some special points for special values of theta. When theta is zero, 
we have the point one, which is e to the i times two pi. When theta is pi over two, we have i, which is e to the i pi over two. When theta is pi, then we have e to the i pi, which is minus one. And finally, when theta is three pi over two, then we have the point minus i. And those are the fourth roots of one. And we can do this for any number. So when we have the nth roots of one, they just look like a regular polygon in the unit circle. So for example, the square roots of one are these two points over here, one and minus one. Now let's look at the cubic roots. They are these three points over here, and they are omega equals one, and then minus a half plus or minus i square root three over two. Then we have the quartic roots of one, which are the ones we saw previously, which are these four over here, one minus one i and minus i. Then we have the six roots of unity, which you can abbreviate as these six things, and they're simply a hexagon. And in general, the nth roots of unity form a regular polygon of n sides in the root of unity containing one. So they can be written as omega equals e to the i times two k pi over n. Now, why is this important? Because our formula contains a bunch of roots of unity, as you can see in the e to the minus i times two pi k over n times little n. So in this formula, we have the result of the DFT, which is capital X sub k, and this x of k are the lengths of the bars that we're rotating. And this thing over here is the rotations. And the summation here is the concatenation of the bars. So let me be more specific. The e to the minus i are the ones that rotate. And the angle of rotation is 2 pi times k over n times n. Let me show you this in a more graphical way. So here we have our original sequence x0 all the way to xn minus 1. And we're going to apply the discrete Fourier transform to get a sequence capital X0 all the way to capital xn minus 1. So the lowercase xn are going to be the lengths of a bunch of segments that we're going to concatenate. Now here I assume that all the xn are real. So we have a horizontal line. But if the xi are complex numbers, then we're just going to have a broken line where each segment goes in any direction. But that doesn't really matter. And when we apply the DFT, what we are doing is at every one of these pivots, we are rotating it by a particular angle. And the angles are 2 pi k over n times 0, which is 0, 2 pi k over n times 1, 2 pi k over n times 2, etc., all the way to 2 pi k over n times n minus 1. And in this case, where they all form a nice line, we get something like this, which resembles a polygon, except it doesn't necessarily close. But the angle between any two consecutive segments is 2 pi times k over n. If the xi are complex, this is not the case. But you can imagine that you take the original segments and rotate each one of them by a angle of 2 pi k over n. And then Wherever the final point lands, that's going to be xk, and that's going to be the corresponding point in the discrete Fourier transform of the original sequence. Now, let me show you the formula for the inverse discrete Fourier transform. So this formula for the discrete Fourier transform is this one over here. And what do you think it's going to be for the inverse DFT? Well, it's the exact same thing with a few small differences. So for example, here, the input is little xn, and the output is big xk. And in the inverse, we have the opposite we have that the input is big xk, which is the DFT of the original sequence, and the output is the original sequence. And the sum is now not over n, but over k. Now notice that in the DFT, we rotate clockwise because we multiply by e to the minus i here. Well, in the inverse DFT, we multiply by e to the plus i, which means we rotate counterclockwise. And finally, we divide by n, which is over here. Now this is by convention that we divide by n in the inverse DFT and not in the DFT. But in some other places, in particular in quantum computing, you can define them differently. In here, they're both divided by the square root of 1 over n. And I'll let you check that these two are inverses in the same way, because at the end, when you apply both, you're dividing by 1 over n, which is the product of the two. Now let me show you the matrix form of the DFT. Let's remember that our example was this sequence 4, 3, 2, 1, which goes to the sequence on the right. Now, Let's put it in vector form as a column vector 4, 3, 2, 1. And notice that if we multiply it by this matrix, we get this vector over here, which corresponds to the sequence of the right. I'll let you check the details, but if you do this matrix multiplication, you will get the vector on the right. And that 4 by 4 matrix has a general form, and the general form comes from the formula for the DFT. If we let omega be 
e to the minus 2 i pi over n, which is a root of unity, so raised to the n is equal to 1, then we can take the sequence x0 up to xn minus 1 and put it here and multiply it by this matrix over here, which is full of roots of unity. It's a pretty standard matrix. And when we multiply them together, we get the discrete Fourier transform sequence. So we can represent the DFT by this matrix over here. And how would the inverse look like? Well, very similar, except for two things. First, there's going to be a different root of unity. It's not going to be e to the minus 2 i pi over n. It's going to be e to the 2 i pi over n, which is another root of unity. It's actually, it's negative. And finally, let's not forget the 1 over n that we have over here, because we divide by n to get the inverse DFT. So this is not the end. There's actually a lot of uses for the DFT. And one very special that I will tell you in the next video is how to detect periodic sequences. So for example, this sequence over here, one, two, three, four, five, six, is not periodic because it doesn't repeat itself. But for example, the sequence one, two, three, one, two, three is periodic with period three because it repeats every three elements. And the sequence one, two, one, two, one, two is periodic with period two because it repeats every two elements. So technically the first one is periodic with period six, but it doesn't really matter. And you'll be happy to see that the discrete Fourier transform is very effective at detecting periodic sequences. And that's very useful for things like Shor's algorithm, which breaks a lot of cryptographical methods using quantum computers. So we'll see all that in the upcoming videos. And another thing we're going to see is a bunch of faster versions of the DFT. So there's something called the fast Fourier transform or FFT, which is a way to calculate the DFT but much, much quicker. And then there's an even quicker one called the quantum Fourier transform, which is a way to calculate the DFT using a quantum computer. So stay tuned for all these updates. And with that, I thank you for your attention. If you enjoyed this video, then definitely subscribe and hit like and comment and share. I love to read your comments. And especially if you have any ideas for future videos, feel free to send them my way. You can also check out my page, serrano.academy, where I have all these videos plus blog posts and a lot more information. You can tweet at me at Serrano Academy. And you can also check out my book, which is Grokking Machine Learning. Here's a discount code you can use in the link in the comments. It's for 40%. So thank you very much and see you in the next video.